Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, latest in the series of the um, Future Leaders Group um, Open UK training sessions. My name is Chris Eastham. I'm a, a technology lawyer at Field Fisher, uh, and I chair the Legal and Policy Committee uh, at Open UK. I'm delighted uh, to be joined today by um, Shane Coughlin. Uh, he's a long-time contributor to open source, uh, having focused on policy and governance, uh, and was instrumental in setting up the European Legal Network, along with um, some of our own Legal and Policy Committee. Uh, he uh, spent uh, a number of years, I think 13 years at Free Software Foundation Europe, and uh, over nine years at Open Forum uh, Europe, um, uh, of which he's still a member. Uh, and for the last um, four years, he's been uh, involved in the Linux Foundation leading the uh, Open Chain project, which is uh, the topic for today. Um, he, uh, he founded the Open Chain project, managing um, supply chain uh, and, uh, and open sources, in, is in the process of acquiring, acquiring ISO standard status for it as well. So um, thanks very much for joining us today, Shane. I'll hand over to you. Wonderful, thank you. So, um, as noted, I've been involved in this field for quite a while. Uh, in terms of being front and center in some organizations, I was front and center in FSFE for about two of the formative years as the uh, legal department was set up. Um, I spent many years later on the uh, board and whatnot. It's the same in Open um, Forum Europe, where uh, I have been engaged with the organization for over a decade. Um, I sat on the board there for, I guess, about eight years. And uh, of course, I've been active in terms of engagement with market product, market situation through uh, both copyright and patents. So I was working with Open Invention Network for about five years. I was global director of licensing for about three. So that was a lot of coverage on the patent side. And uh, we, we scaled in OIN from a patent cross-license um, community of when I joined uh, about 59 companies uh, to the point where when I completed my work as global director of licensing to uh, about 1,950 companies in a patent on aggression patent. With the Linux Foundation, I've been involved in activities across the Linux Foundation and particularly the compliance sphere uh, for more than a decade, but I've been specifically uh, working inside and part of the Linux Foundation for approximately four years. It has been my task to take the work on a standard for open source compliance and to deploy that uh, into the market in an effective manner. Naturally, this does not happen alone. And great credit and great um, debt is due to the people who were formative to open chain itself. So the original idea came from a conversation with you between a few parties, particularly people such as David Marr of Qualcomm, Sammy Atabani of ARM, other parties. Uh, Dave Marr observed that when it came to managing the open source supply chain from the optics of compliance, there were challenges. Uh, the issue of dealing with multiple suppliers on the compliance front, having no single approach to managing the processes and having different customer companies asking for different things made the supply chain quite unpredictable and then effectively hard to trust. So the idea was how do we create an approach for managing these processes that allows trust to increase and errors to decrease alongside a reduction in resources allocated. And that's where the germ of the idea of the Open Chain project came in. The first version of this specification or standard was released in October 2016. We really got down to work on Open Chain and I formally joined the project um, as 
its management leader around March of 2017. We've had a few iterations of the standard over time, and I'll come back to that. But basically, the idea that went to market in October 2016, we're doing today, is a consistent, regular, reliable path. We have iterated a couple of the terms or framing of requirements based on feedback, particularly from non-native English speakers. Uh, but we set in motion a certain approach, and we've maintained a very steady, reliable course. Uh, this is by design. Any standard needs to be consistent and reliable. And even if iterations occur, they have to logically follow on not just the abstract, but the requirements of practical market deployment. Let's dig in. How do we trust open source supply chains? There's a lot of work around governance in open source these days. It's certainly not a wild west of unpredictable. By way of example, the Linux Foundation, which has a very large corpus of member companies, and a huge collection of projects, only one of which is Linux. Uh, there is an open compliance program, which acts as an umbrella on which we can frame and under which we can place uh, Linux Foundation related projects to compliance. Some of the projects are pretty low level. Um, some of them are focused on, let's say, tooling, such as Fossology. That's a scanning tool which can do license identification and so on. Some of them are a little bit higher in the abstraction stack, such as SPDX, which is a specification for a software bill of materials. So it's a nice consistent standard for describing what's the software, what version is it, what license is it, and what's inside it, and so on. Um, SPDX is explicitly designed to be both human and machine readable, so you can quickly understand that if you use a common software bill of materials like SPDX and your tooling supports it, like Fossology, you have a much easier process for automation. Now, of course, you have to have something to frame the big picture. It's no good to have tools um, and no context. It's no good to have software bill of materials and no context for how you could, should, and may wish to utilize it. So OpenChain is really at the top of this stack. It's all about process management. It's about identifying what's a good idea. And once you've identified that, once you've identified the process points, you can begin to fill out the process content with actions such as, okay, we're going to use a software bill of materials as our language of compliance so that we and third parties have a single baseline for describing what's in software. We're going to use automation at certain points um, to make this process quicker and less resource intensive and so on. But first you set the context. So the type of companies that set the context for OpenChain are varied. Uh, here's our current publicly announced platinum member companies. And you'll see ARM alongside Toyota, alongside Microsoft, who's alongside BMW, and so on and so forth. It's a diversity of companies, extreme diversity of companies multiple market sectors, some significant different sizes, and most importantly, geographic spread, uh, with a good example being OPPO from China, beside Comcast in the US. These are just the Platinum board members. So these are companies that sit on the Open Chain Project board and help provide strategic overview, but they're a nice representative example of the hundreds of companies engaged in the community. Companies like this, came together to brainstorm the most effective way to describe process management in open source. And it was determined that defining the key requirements of a quality open source compliance program was the optimal way forward. So just to put that in a certain context, the mental model here is to identify what is absolutely essential and to clearly 
unambiguously vocalize that so that peeping, people wishing to have a quality open source compliance program know very quickly, very concisely, and very accurately what type of requirements should they have top of mind as they act. Now, there are several ways to go around describing requirements. One example would be to have an incredibly long list of requirements. And indeed, the Linux Foundation, at an earlier point in the evolution of open source compliance, published a checklist, a checklist with 144 checklist items related to things you really could, should, or may want to do around open source license compliance. A checklist with 144 questions is unwieldy, and in fast-moving, resource-constrained areas like, let's say, the embedded or consumer electronics supply chain, supplier companies don't have the time, they don't have the money, and they don't have the internal expertise to address a lengthy checklist such as that. It's not to say it's useless, it can provide some ideas and context, but it's not optimal for adoption as an approach. Not every party will be able to implement regardless of desire. So instead of taking that type of granular approach, OpenChain defines inflection points. It defines the moments where there should be a process in play, but it's not uh, prescriptive regarding the specific content of that individual process. You can quickly understand that if that is a designed mechanism, it allows every company to have processes at the inflection points where errors occur, but every company to have flexibility in determining the appropriate process for their industry sector and their company size. In conjunction with other companies from the optics of, let's say, a supply chain, it becomes eminently understandable that the companies in the supply chain will help set the baselines of what's appropriate in terms of process content in collaboration over time. As more companies become open chain conformant and as a single supply chain increasingly is linked by such conformant companies, the natural economic interaction of these companies will help drive a baseline, organic, accurate, and meaningful level of process content complexity for the problem space. But pulling back, the most important thing is that every single company, the process management is the same. So if we are looking at an error and we're seeking some form of remediation, we can very quickly go through the companies and the process management to discover a failure point and to seek correction with the minimal cost in terms of time and in terms of personnel. So OpenChain has been in market for a while. It's described in various ways, but most particularly in terms of conformant organizations, companies that have adopted OpenChain and have an OpenChain conformant program. There are logos that uh, represent what version of OpenChain they are conformant with. I mentioned OpenChain went to market in October 2016. In the subsequent six month period, there was an update of the specification with some clarifications and typing of language. And six months subsequent to that, there was another update, OpenChain 1.2. Again, refinements. A slightly more substantial update to OpenChain occurred in April 2019. OpenChain 2.0 is not a rewrite of the process inflection point requirements, but it did have significantly improved language for clarity and translation uh, in non-native uh, English. So to ensure that as an international standard, it's truly international, the construct of 2.0 was particularly and explicitly designed to make sure that in places such as the Asian supply chain, for example, in China or Korea, it's easy for companies, not at the front-facing international tier, but companies producing products or components or support aspects 
uh, related to going to market with open source and actually understand in their own language, in their own context, how this standard works. So what type of company adopts this standard? The adoption map is even more diverse than the companies involved map. So uh, even that we're in the UK, or at least you are, and I'm virtually attending from Japan, we can pick up two nice examples. ARM is an obvious one. As a founder of the Open Chain project, they've been involved since day one. And they're also a company which inherently relies on intellectual property for deriving their business relationships and income, and therefore always seeks excellence in this space. The adoption of Open Chain by a company like ARM is both easily understandable and a great case study in the reasoning behind why such a standard is useful for a company with uh, mature, reliable intellectual property management. Another example of adoption in the UK would be ABEHR, which is Electronic Health Record provision for NHS Digital, so the British National Health Service. So there you have two very different use cases where organizations decided to have open chain conformant programs. And as you pull out to the world at large, the diversity explodes. So you've got consumer electronic companies like Sony operating side by side with operating system companies such as Suze or infrastructure providers such as Hitachi, cloud technology companies such as Google. This diversity is no less an aberration or a surprise than the diversity of the Open Chain board members. Of course, there is no conclusive answer to how many companies are Open Chain conformant, because by and large, and I'll come back to this, our community focuses on self-certification. And that means that companies announce their conformant to their supply chain. And of course, inherent to their conformance, part of the open chain standard are the mechanisms and ability to explain to your customer companies how precisely you're conforming. In other words, this is an organic standard. It goes out and is designed to work through the economics of sales and procurement. Some companies want to advertise their conformance broadly not just to their customers, but also to the market at large. And those companies have tended to make uh, large public statements. Other companies, for whatever reason, are more concerned with either internal intellectual property management or direct uh, customer company or vendor company uh, relationships. Regardless, we have plenty of companies publicly announcing conformance and gives us a real example of the type of scope of engagement around the world. Scope. What an interesting word and particularly applicable to something like the Open Chain Project. Our main mailing list has got thousands of subscribers. Uh, in global work groups such as automotive or reference tooling, we have well north of 100 or nearly 200 participants from at least half as many of that in terms of companies. We have local work groups in China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, India, Germany, and just recently launched the UK. Our biggest local work group is Japan with approximately 190 people from over 80 companies proactively engaging, not just with their main work group meetings every two months, but also across seven sub work groups, engaging particularly in product activities. And I'm talking here knowledge product, such as preparing supplier education leaflets to help with adoption. And these activities, local activities, such as making a supplier education leaflet in Japanese, are most frequently accompanied with translation into these days, English, uh, Chinese simplified, Chinese traditional, and Korean, with Germany coming up quickly in terms of translations. It's hard to put a finger on precisely what type of company engagement you see. 
but common, common would be embedded consumer electronics, enterprise, infrastructure, and automotive. Now, when it comes to adopting a standard, there are multiple mechanisms. The most basic, the core experience would, of course, be to download a standard or view it online, read the specification, and determine precisely the steps required to allow you to say with confidence that you match all the requirements of the specification. Um, OpenChain, as a user company project, is always concerned with making life easy for the user companies. So to support the implementation of self-certification, OpenChain has a questionnaire that does some of that mental modeling for you. It presents a series of yes-no questions, and quite simply, if you can answer yes with confidence to every question, you're OpenChain conformant. If, however, you cannot answer yes to one or more questions, you have identified points where it is productive and useful to apply compliance resources to change your no from a yes. Uh, sorry, change your no into a yes. In other words, our questionnaire allows companies to determine conformance. It allows companies to determine resource allocation. And of course, more generically, it allows companies to do health checks and health double checks after a period of time. Indeed, this self-certification questionnaire has an interesting inherent user base. Our analysis shows that approximately 50% of the user companies are working on conformance. 50% are doing health checks or one type or another with you know, conformance not being something that's off the table, but their primary goal is health checks right now. That scope of engagement, those percentages indicate that the self-certification questionnaire, first and foremost, provides a simple way to have an understanding of what is useful to do in open source license compliance. And two, a simple way, if you choose it is appropriate and useful, to self-certify to the standard itself. Now, providing people with yes-no questions and all the adjacent supporting material in terms of actually answering those questions is a task in and of itself. The open chain standard is small, approximately seven to 12 pages with plenty of white space formatting, depending on the format taken. I'll come back to that thought uh, a little bit later. But let's just say OpenChain is a short, concise standard, and it can be easily distilled into yes-no questions for adoption. When it comes to mental modeling around answering such questions, many companies are seeking baselines. They may have a training program, but they're not quite sure if the training program is of an appropriate density, duration, and indeed uh, topic content to ensure they can answer with confidence that they're training their staff in open source and open source compliance. This type of need, I wouldn't say for validation, I would say for inspiration and support, is met most effectively in the OpenChain project through our reference material. The reference material ranges from training slides, such as the Open Chain curriculum, which have been distilled from immensely useful contributions from companies such as Qualcomm, ARM, um, companies such as Samsung and Royal Philips Electronics. In terms of, actually, they provided internal training material, and we distilled it all down into a short, concise slide deck. There are other materials, case studies, for instance, about OpenChain and the NHS, or how Toyota is working with OpenChain, uh, guides in multiple languages, whether you're looking for the most typical things, such as Japanese and Chinese, or you're looking at other things like having material in Russian. It's all there. A lot of it's on the website. Uh, the, how to put it? I say the tent pole items around the website, the big case studies, the training deck, the supplier education leaflet. But we actually have hundreds of documents. The last I checked, we had 405 documents. We keep them on GitHub, and we try to order them out into 
what they are, such as a checklist or a guide. And then as people explore it, they're able to see what's the official material from the project and what's a community contribution that is not official material from the project. This helps, you know, in essence, people to quickly understand what material has been distilled by a lot of eyes and what material is the product of one or a small number of organizations. We are always working to make discovery in the reference material easier, um, and we're always expanding the library itself because we have a lot of companies interested in contributing. Now, I mentioned user companies earlier, and OpenChain is indeed created by, managed by, and in service to user companies around open source. It's about people with this shared challenge working together to address it effectively. But of course, to address it effectively, we have questions along the lines of how do we obtain support from various vendors and service providers? if and when we want to have assistance on any aspect of open source, license compliance, management, education policy, and so on. So OpenChain does have a partner program which provides us with narrowly defined, clearly contextualized format for relationships with various types of service providers. The blue shows where we have coverage uh, today. And you can see we have nice coverage in, in various domains, many of the important geographies, such as the United States, Germany, China, and so on. In the next few days, we'll be announcing enhanced coverage. Uh, for example, Taiwan. You'll notice it's conspicuously uh, marked with white on this particular map, but we have two partner announcements coming up there. We don't have uniform global coverage, nor do we need it. And we don't have uniform global coverage in every important jurisdiction, which we do currently want to accomplish. But we do have coverage in pretty much every major geography for open source production and compliance challenges, with the exception today of Taiwan, France, and Russia. Of course, we'll be working to correct those gaps, especially in light of something I'll come back to later. The type of partners, well, here's an example of some of the law firms from a relatively small focused law firms such as Moorcrofts in the UK, through to uh, firms with a large global uh, connection with offices and multiple jurisdiction presence such as CMS. In other words, all types of specialized legal support is available. And much the same holds true of more general service providers, whether it's consultancies or system integrators and so on. So you have, uh, again, pulling up examples, uh, in the UK you have source code control, you've got uh, Orcro organizations which can help with training and certification and so on. On the global side, you've got PwC and YPro. Nice diversity there, and it's always expanding. Basically, we want to have a situation where any user company in any geography will be able to find at least three service providers. I'm glad to say that today we're actually able to do that uh, in all of the major geographies I cited before. Uh, sometimes, most likely, most often, it's a local partner, but not inherently. You may find that the coverage in a jurisdiction is predicated on a multinational provider. Which brings me to vendors. When we say vendors here, we're actually talking about tooling vendors or companies which offer proprietary automation solutions. So we have Synopsys and FOSS ID as official partners. And third-party certifiers. Uh, we have PwC and TOSA. I'd like to pause and dive into third-party certification for a moment. So I put a lot of emphasis and energy into self-certification, whereby companies look at the open chain standard and elect to answer the questions necessary to determine if they meet the requirements of the standard or not. Such self-certification is extremely common. It's particularly useful in spaces such as our own, where you can utilize the economics of the supply chain itself 
to determine what the eventual appropriate baselines of quality are for different flows across the supply chain. But of course, in some sectors or some situations, people would like the activity and also the burden of certification to be placed on a third party provider. In other words, a company may elect, instead of self-certifying themselves, to have an organization such as PwC or TUFSUD to certify them. It's the polar opposites of approaching adoption of a standard. And both PwC and TUFSUD offer global coverage in that context. I'm going to come back to things like self-certification and third-party certification in a few minutes, but I would like to pause and now explain relevance more thoroughly. OpenChain has been a de facto or deployed in practice used industry standard since October 2016. Its form and its function as a de facto standard has allowed us to significantly increase awareness and cohesion around open source compliance in different aspects of the global supply chain. But to take things to the next level, to build a community of thousands of companies rather than hundreds, you have to have formal international standards. In other words, instead of being a standard used by the industry and widely known and adopted, such as OpenChain, you need also to have a standard fitting into the portfolio management of parties who may have little to no experience or resources allocated to something like open source. Open source in standardization is not new, but it is becoming more topical as open source essentially takes over the entire software world. OpenChain in particular took steps to engage with standardization via ISO. The reasoning is, of course, entirely reasonable, entirely understandable. For parties that are not particularly knowledgeable in open source per se, particularly open source business intelligence and uh, management experience, Understanding an ISO number is important is easier than understanding a de facto industry standard is important. It's also much easier for sales and procurement departments to engage with and include an ISO number in their discussions and negotiations as part of their broader portfolio of ISO standards deployed in such context. For example, in automotive, a company may ask its supplier to be ISO 9001, quality standard, quality process standard, conformant. They might ask their supplier to be ISO 26262 conformant, that's functional safety. And then they may ask their supplier to be open chain conformant. And if it's ISO, it's another number to include. Now, as it happens, we have just graduated the ISO process, our voting completed on the 23rd of September. And that means that ISO will be publishing us as a formal international standard within six weeks or less. And you can see a preview of the standard at the link below. This is a big step. This is really about massive scaling. To upping our game in terms of the scope of engaged entities and the scope of engaged party type very different to have an open source program office engaging with an open source de facto standard and having procurement departments in completely different companies do the same. We're very fortunate to be in that pivotal moment when this is occurring. And a huge debt of thanks to everyone we work to to make open chain an international standard, a formal ISO standard. And we do expect the next six to 12 months to see a large scale change in the type of mind share we'll have. Yeah, so the long story short on that is that OpenChain came out of intensive, productive, and efficient industry discussions. It matured nicely, it spread across the world, adoption was increasing dramatically, and the pivot into becoming a formal ISO international standard was entirely in line with where we're going and of course will significantly determine the future of this standard. Now 
Put most simply, there's a standard for open source compliance, period. Okay, so adoption. I said we'd come back to this. There's really three ways that you can engage with a standard to adopt it. The first is self-certification, which on the face of it might appear to be the lightest process, but not necessarily. I'll come back to that in a minute. There is independent assessment in our context, independent compliance assessment, where a third party looks at your self-certification and makes potential suggestions for refinement or improvement. And then there's full third party certification from an entity such as Tube said, where they do it for you. So there's a spectrum of how you can meet a standard. And this is no less true of OpenChain um, than it is of any other national standard. Self certification is at the heart of OpenChain and always will be. The key thing with OpenChain is to allow companies to quickly understand what they need to do and begin implementation of quality open source compliance programs. I said that this appears to be the easiest option, but isn't always. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to take a moment to explain why that is so. There is an assumption that was held inside our community in the early days and certainly is top of mind for people new to finding out or discussing self-certification. There is a concern that people will simply say yes to every question regardless of the actual situation of their conformance or their sophistication. And indeed, in concept and in theory, certainly that is a valid concern. It's a valid proposition. However, our market experience, our deployment experience, tells us the opposite is true. When faced with a yes-no question to determine the quality of a compliance program, companies tend to opt on answering the questions as thoroughly as possible. Occasionally, to the extent of making process content that is far heavier, far more sophisticated and far more resource, resource intensive than it would inherently need to be in general terms. So somewhat ironically, self-certification, which is the easiest and potentially lightest way to adopt the standard, but quite often fosters um, sophisticated and occasionally weighty answers to questions to ensure the yes is unequivocal. We try to address that with our reference material to show people potential baselines. So they're not casting around too long or too far to try to frame their appropriate levels of engagement. But anyway, self-certification is at the heart of open chain. It always will be. Our graduation in the ISO does not change that. In fact, when it comes to what happened in ISO, for the open chain project beyond the ISO number, not much will change except that we become easier for third parties outside of our normal remit to engage and adopt. We edit the standard with the same committees in the same manner. We continue our self-certification services such as our web app, which is listed here. Um, and of course, we continue to do things like make the standard itself available on our website. So people can get it from ISO within the six weeks publication date or they can get it from us. Now, those of you who are sharper than I would have noticed that when I talked about the ISO version of the OpenChain standard, the link I provided said OpenChain 2.1. And you will realize very quickly that OpenChain 2.0, the current version of the standard and the one on the website is um, apparently a, rev a revision below. Um, is the Open chain standard today different from the ISO standard incoming in six weeks? No. Uh, Open chain 2.1 is just the reformatting of the standards layout to match the uh, ISO requirements. In other words, anyone conformant with Open chain 2 will be conformant with Open chain 2.1 because they are functionally identical. And they can check their conformance through self-certification, either by downloading a list of questions or engaging via the web app to run through those questions online and in private for free, naturally. Independent compliance assessment, as I said, 
is a relatively straightforward process of someone looking how you're self-certifying, whether they're a law firm, a consultancy, or accounting firm, and they offer guidance on what's the appropriate level of answer to various questions. And third-party certification, other end of the spectrum, someone comes in and does the certification for you. The type of industry where third-party certification is more common would be industries such as infrastructure and automotive, where the regulation is extremely heavy and where the organizations engaging in the field um, can have significant leverage in terms of product placement and portfolio management in procurement discussions with governments and so on, or large consumer bodies, or indeed lawmakers, uh, through third-party certification as a validation mechanism. And OpenChain, no less than any other standard, uh, supports that. As we approach the wrap-up here, I think what I'd like to emphasize is that OpenChain has been initiated, edited, deployed, and managed by user companies to identify the inflection points that such user companies understand as potential areas of pain when it comes to open source license compliance management. The standard is effective because it's entirely built on what people do in the real world and what they need to do to reduce resource costs and increase deployment effectiveness. Self-certification, and this is based on experience rather than assertion, self-certification is an effective method of reducing the risk and increasing the efficiency, obtaining the gains that we seek. Indeed, self-certification has been an excellent method for doing so. Uh, the choice, though, of independent compliance assessment and third-party certification is important. Partially, you could say it's important as a validation of this standard being mature enough that such provision is available. But more importantly, it's important uh, because it means that companies have the freedom to decide how they will become conformant with the international standard for open source uh, license compliance. Providing freedom of choice here is no less important than it is in developing code or in having the freedom to manage your business relationships as you see fit. If there's one major point you should take away, it's that OpenChain as a project, and OpenChain as an international standard, is the product of user companies built for user companies. The collaboration here is extremely similar to the collaboration you'd see around an open source software project, where people with a shared challenge came together to create a shared, effective approach to addressing that challenge. In this case, managing open source code process to ensure that open source license compliance is something that companies can address effectively. We're not limited to just that. Of course, open chain can be useful to companies in other spaces. For example, many companies, uh, for one reason or another, are tending to include open chain in their discussions around security. Uh, the reason is self-evident. If a company has a clear internal um, inbound and outbound set of processes for identifying software license compliance, such processes inherently identify the software and version number, um, which, of course, follows naturally, covers an awful lot of the security homes out there. So OpenChain is designed for open source license compliance and applied in such a space, but of course is also being utilized by organizations in other areas, and we have productive open dialogue on those fronts. If you are not part of the open chain community, one of the main takeaways you should, well, have today is that this is an open community that positively embraces open engagement. So join the community. Go to the website and our Get Started page and you know, have a look at previous community activity, whether it be our bi-weekly webinar recordings or our interview series. Have a look at our self-certification questionnaire have a look at our reference material, join our calls. We have bi-weekly specification calls, bi-weekly webinars, bi-weekly tooling meetings, 
We have quarterly meetings of things like our automotive work group uh, in local spaces, such as the UK. The local groups there are active. I believe the next meeting for the UK work group is the 30th of September. And of course, you can access our resources, such as the self-certification questionnaire. Whether you're interested in self-certifying or doing a health check or just curious, um, using that self-certification questionnaire is private unless people choose to publish their results. And there's no limit to what you can do on it in terms of setting up and having your colleagues also join you with different accounts. I am always available to help explain to you how this international standard for open source compliance works and how it can effectively support your activities. So please do at any time without hesitation, engage with us, email me, and be part of this, what is now um, an extremely large, effective, friendly, and collaborative community deploying an international standard that resolves one of our major problems spaces. And there I finish and throw open the floor for questions, if any. Thanks, Shane. That was, um, that was great. I think uh, Amanda may have a question. Yes, so I hand go up. do. My hand is up. I'll lower my hand now and be really good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. I have a new headset. So you're the first person I've spoken to on my headset, Shane. Um, I have lots of questions for you, but they tend to be a variation on a theme and they tend to be around the practicalities and the cost. And I don't know whether that's something at this stage that the, the Open Chain Project has transparency on. But if I'm sitting in the UK, I assume, as you said, there's at least three suppliers that I can go to in the UK. I don't believe they have to be law firms, but you mentioned law firms. Do I need uh, someone to do compliance and a law firm? Is it an either or? Do I need both? I suppose that's my first question. Most companies do all of this internally, so they okay. don't use third parties at all. Um, in some cases, it's relatively simple. If you're a very small company with the knowledge expertise, the weight of your processes will be low. And therefore, implementation, as long as you have people experienced in open source and more generally compliance, is straightforward. You might be training five people and have a very simple inbound and outbound process. So that can be quite easy. It can also be quite easy for extremely large entities, uh, which have sophisticated um, teams in place, which already work on this, but now find a way to coalesce around a single industry standard. It can be more challenging somewhere in the middle, where a company is relatively significant in size in terms of personnel and process complexity, but they don't have specific domain knowledge around open source, or, and they don't have resource allocation to address this. That's probably where we see the most interest in working with third parties, whether it's a law firm or a tooling provider or whatever. The long and short answer is, if you already have process management in place, Adopting the international standard is relatively straightforward um, and relatively efficient in process costs. It's usually a lot cheaper than maintaining bespoke approaches. If you don't have processes in place, if you don't have domain experience and you're a relatively large entity, that's where things could potentially become expensive. But of course, again, the open chain user company community has been working hard to provide information to make that resource cost as low as possible, to give people shortcuts, one could say. Okay, so I think if I was to do that as a headline, we would say that if you have somebody in your organization, whether you are a company that does open source or not, who's experienced in governance, and that could be an engineer who's pretty sophisticated, or who's been involved in projects where they, they've done the governance in the past. It's a variation on a theme for them and they'll understand it. The smaller the company, obviously, the easier it is, you would hope, although I don't know if that would always be the case. For yeah. bigger companies, you're definitely going to need somebody who understands open source governance. And then we've got this sort of in-between space with companies who don't have a, a tradition in open source, but are amongst the many adopters these days, or um, open source companies that perhaps haven't focused on governance before, and there's that 
bit in the middle, like a Venn diagram, where you might need some support, but you may also yes. be able to go to the Open Chain tools and just pick those up. Yeah, so it's very exactly. accessible. Yeah, okay. uh, I mean, so, for example, you may have no domain experience, no open source, but you may find our reference training slides perfectly adequate um, to provide the foundation of a training program that makes your people aware. Yeah. I'll give a specific example here, um, and I use it quite a lot because it's just it's funny, but Philip Morris International in Switzerland uh, engaged with OpenChain pretty proactively. They did so because with their iCAS cigarette, their back end was pivoting from B to B into B to C. And what they were building in terms of logistics infrastructure for going straight to customers uh, was substantially based on open source. And naturally they're new to the field and they wanted to make sure intellectual property management was effective. It therefore made immediate sense for them to work on adopting the international standard in the space. While doing so, they did seek help uh, from a service provider in the UK, um, and that was a choice. It was a case of, it was cost effective to work with a third party in what they were doing. And it's always based on what's most cost effective. Uh, another opposite example would be SUSE, which became open chain conformant in Germany. SUSE makes an operating system. They are probably one of the greatest uh, expertise silos in open source. So when they decided to adopt open chain, of course, they didn't need any help from anyone. Um, and they had the domain experience to do it quickly. But, and this is where I put a heartening note, even a company such as SUSE, was far from perfect in open source process management. So they found it tremendously useful uh, to use OpenChain. They could very quickly adopt it, but it was enlightening for them for optimizing process management. In particular, an outcome was the publication of a new open source policy by SUSE, which they've made freely available uh, with open licensing, based on the full contextualization of the standard. So yeah, domain experience, time, and so on, all determine whether you do it internally or seek a third party provider. And of course, there's a middle ground here where a lot of companies seek third party help via the community and other user companies, which is a, a different but equally effective route. And you mean the open chain community there? Or do you mean general? Yeah, by, by and large. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say exclusively open chain. Um, you know, people can wander off and be attending, let's say, general Linux Foundation events, and they'll get a lot of domain experience. But yeah, if you want to cut to the chase, if you want to adopt Open Chain, it's extremely easy and productive to work inside the Open Chain community where all the other user companies have precisely the same challenges. That's interesting. And I asked the question, having worked in an open source company where obviously a lot of people really know what they're doing, but if yeah. you've started life in that environment, actually having documented processes might not be yeah. where you are. So it's an interesting, there's lots of evolutions going on. And then the PMI example is a great one. You know, a company that you might not have considered a cigarette manufacturer as a, a tech company. Now looking at devices as a classic example of the move to digitization and ultimately open source. Really good example, Shane. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you about, which correlates to that is price. Yes. So, is there a cost to participate in the community, to be conformant, to be, you know, and if there isn't, how are you funded? Uh, so, no, there's no cost at all. Um, the cost, if any, would be a determination to work with a third party service provider, which is something people can do if they wish. It's got nothing to do with our particular positioning of the standard. So there's no cost. We are funded by our platinum member company. So at the beginning, I showed a list of 20 companies such as Microsoft, Arm, Toyota, and so on. Uh, these companies are investing in open chain, not out of altruistic desire, though of course they're happy to help everyone, but because this standard is critical for resource effectiveness. And these companies in particular are influential and also required users of this standard. So yeah. basically we're funded by some of the particularly large companies that find this useful and, that, and that's, this will help out their supply chain. That's not an unusual model in open source. Is yeah. the funding adequate that if somebody goes down the route of 
investing the time or the money in becoming conformant that they know that this is not going anywhere. Yes. There we go. Um, and perhaps most importantly, now as an ISO standard, it's definitely absolutely not going anywhere. Um, yeah. Even if for some reason all of the Platinum board members decided to wander off, the project itself um, does have a surplus. So it will operate in terms of marketing and whatnot for a considerable period. But more importantly, the project can and could be maintained even without funding at this juncture. The really expensive stuff has been done. And now it's much more about marketing and knowledge awareness and so on. But perhaps even more importantly, as an ISO standard, it's eminently possible at any point for sustainability to set up committees for management of the standard in an evolution of the existing structure. There's no intent to change any part of the structure. There's no um, visible requirement to do it in any horizon. But the mechanisms, the precedent, and the effectiveness of doing so is there. Now as an ISO standard in short, open chain is never going anywhere. Yeah, I, I hope you don't mind me asking what feels, as someone who's also running an open source organization, like a slightly personal question, but of course all of our funding is public for both of us. But it's one of those things that people worry about and might be too polite to ask you if they're thinking of going yes. down this route. So I, I'm glad we were able to answer that today. I think oh, yes. I'm done, Shane. Thank you. And just on the money point, um, so for instance, Open Chain is extremely clear on our funding. Every platinum member contributes uh, 20,000 US dollars. So, in terms of publicly announced platinum members, that's $400,000 a year uh, funding. And of course, running an international standard is not super expensive because you're dealing with a specification. And when it comes to things like resource material, we're dealing with an enormous community of contributors. So, a lot of the resource cost is based on things like in essence, marketing outreach and strategic decisions about what events to underwrite and support that are pivotal uh, in influencing people. So our spend is flexible, and therefore we're in a fortunate position that our run rate is very different to, let's say, a software development project which has engineers and a steady fixed cost, which is far more difficult to maintain. But I would note that in general, Open source relevant companies are very experienced in and used to uh, supporting projects. So once you begin to build out the momentum and the corpus of engagement, uh, the funding situation becomes essentially far less of a concern than it would be in the early days or in other domains. Great, thank you so much, Shane. Again, um, that was really interesting. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we've got Adam Johns from IBM talking next Friday and Amanda herself talking about commercial models and open source the Friday after, Friday the night. So hopefully see some of you there. And thank you again, Shane. Thank you very much. Have a thank good you. day. Bye.